I am Sherry Wei. I am the founder and CTO of Aviatrix. Um, I have the opportunity to work with uh, many um, cloud architects and practitioners in helping them deploy uh, cloud networks, cloud networking. So today I'm going to share with you the journey they walk through and hopefully that will give you ideas so that when you are designing your cloud networks so you have these points in, uh, in mind and, and uh, so you can get it right. A lot of times people you know, develop as they go and make mistakes and correct, but I'm here to share that uh, uh, learning points and the patterns of the design in the cloud. Hopefully that uh, you can take away and help you in the future. So we are a cloud networking company, right? Our business is about connecting to the cloud. And typically, the first thing uh, companies do, um, they started with a few VPCs. Um, I, I put in three VPCs for DevOps. And the first thing, uh, when they need to go production, they need to connect it to on-prem, to your data center, right? The natural thought is, OK, I'm going to do a, you know, um, a VPN connection, or I'm going to do simple something like that. And then soon they realize, the, uh, we talk about the, the growth of the VPCs once the, the cloud deployment production takeoff, people have the, uh, have the taste of how agile and how convenient it is. It quickly start to grow. Why? Because different BUs have different accounts and different accountability, visibility, all of that. So pretty soon your VPC become 100. It's not surprising we've been working with the customers who have hundreds of them. Right. Now, to do each one of them, connectivity becomes invisible for different reasons. One is, you know, this connection involves edge router change, and edge router change involves a, a change control process and, you know, um, a downtime and, or, or a maintenance windows and all of that. So this architecture apparently is not going to scale, and this architecture started to evolve into what we call transient network. And the pattern emerging that is very popular in the very uh, even medium scale uh, network is you have a transit VPC where this is, this is your transit hub. And you build one connectivity to on-prem. And then you, this, this worker VPCs become spokes and they're connected to the hub. When they're connected to the hub, then they, they have connectivity to on-prem. Um, so that way, because you, when you spin up a new VPC, it takes only two minutes. If it doesn't make sense to wait for two weeks for this connection, but by doing transit hub and spoke architecture, now when you stand up a spoke, you can immediately, through a Terraform API or point and click, you can connect it to your data center. So that is the first pattern, transit network. Obviously, you know, if we're really thinking about the entire cloud deployment, how people actually use it, there is also a shared service VPC. Uh, you guys probably know about it. You know, that's where you put your tools and you put your security scanning stuff in there so that you can make sure your instances are up to code and they're updated and all of that. So this architecture, this is what we call the first use case or the, the things you need to consider is the uh, transit network. Obviously, this is a single region, right? Because you, when you start it, you have, this could be a direct connect, could be an internet, you're in one region. But for any, a lot of enterprises are more uh, globally deployed. So let's say, you have a, let's say you have another VPC. If it's just one single VPC in a different region, you can always connect it to this hub and grow like that. But what if you have another entire data center over here? And it's got people, it's got compute, it's got servers, and you can then build a second, second transit hub. Okay, let's say you build like that. So that is your second. This is your multi-region. This is another data center. This is data center two. So that is your multi-region uh, transit hubs, and you can build redundancy through. You know, you have a direct connect, and then you have an internet as a backup. And obviously, you know, we're thinking about this. You have MPOS. Your, your existing connectivity is there. But this is how you build a globally scale network for your hybrid connectivity. This is the transit, the first, the first um, use case. And then 
once you have that built out, the, the immediate another problem come up is these are, these are, remember these are servers, right? From the DevOps point of view, those are compute. These are EC2 instances and they're programs and they need to access other services via APIs, right? Very simple. They may need to go to New Relic for their, um, the API calls to go to New Relic for their APM monitor. They may need to go to Splunk for their log service. And they, they're, oh, they may go to GitHub for get the code, right? So now these VPCs suddenly need to go to, I call them internet, internet access. What are these type of traffic? These are HTTP, HTTPS, or SFTP. Typically, SF, SF, or SSH. You know, you may need to load a file transfer. You may need to do this. Now, think about this. If this EC2 instance, typically, if you have to, if they have to travel on prem to hub to data center, go through your firewall, then to these services the app will endure very long latency. Right? The app performance will be impacted. So the optimal way is to have them access the internet directly, distributed, executed into each VPC. Right? But I then, have a question for you. Yes. Sorry to interrupt, but how yeah. much latency are you talking about here? Oh, it depends. Milliseconds or huh? how much latency? We're talking between? about, yeah. it depends, right? So if your data center to your Equinix is 20 millisecond to another region is 40, 55 millisecond, and then your, your service is in somewhere else where you can either talk about another 120 millisecond, 200 millisecond latency. It depends on that. Nowadays, you know, you want to have high performance. You want to have less than 20 millisecond latency. You want to distribute it, yeah. Okay. So, and, and also it creates a lot of bottlenecks. Right? If your internet bound traffic has to travel like this and then go to internet, this hub becomes a central point of failure, single point of choke point of all kinds of things. So you want the egress bound traffic to go out egress themselves and on-prem bound traffic going down this. You want the traffic to be fully distributed whenever you don't want to create a central choke point. That's another point of egress. But then egress is not so easy, right? You remember you are in, when you're in the on-prem, your egress have to have pan, you have to put a lot of firewalls. That's because on-prem egress has a mix of traffic of people and servers. Right, your people are surfing YouTube's, go to Amazon.com to buy the Prime Day, and and you also have you also have servers, your hosting services, but typically, so you need a full blown firewall service. But in the cloud, these are programs, these are machines. They just they have a deterministic place to visit. But you want it to be a uh, you you want it to be wide list them so that they don't go out to the places you don't. Need to go. So these are the considerations. So that's the second point you need to consider when you're architect. It's the egress security. That will immediately come up. Um, without going into a lot of detail, we're going to come back, touch on it. And the third one is now you, you, know, you are in Amazon, you're AWS, you're happy, and suddenly you have a .NET engineer, and he stood up a, a VNet, right? He stood up a VNet, and in Azure, he says, I need connectivity. So now you need to connect, you can connect it to the hub of the Azure. You, you don't necessarily, actually a lot of people, you don't need always to do that express route everywhere just so that you have one VNet in Azure. You can actually connect that into this AWS hub and then connect it to on-prem. The, the thing is you need to think about this, this product or this service, obviously it's aviatrix, that need to provide this multi-cloud that being able to take you or connect you to different environment. So that is the multi-cloud, peering multi-cloud connectivity. This is just to connect it to on-prem for yourself, but sometimes your partner may be in Azure that you need connectivity, you know, your, your service partners and, and things like that. So that's the third use case that people come across in their journey, right? The fourth one has to do with, we call side to cloud. A lot of times it refers to two types. One is your service itself needs to connect it to partners. So let's say you have many brand, either partners, partners or branches, PI, PJ. You know, you, you, you can connect your branches or your partners to the cloud, right? How do you connect them efficiently? because the native cloud provider solutions, they're not meant to connect hundreds of them. They're meant to connect uh, you know, tens, fifteens, and stuff like that. When you need to connect and scale, you need to consider 
if the solution, how you know, visibility, monitoring, ease of use, simplicity, all of this come to play. So that's the connecting to, connecting to your um, branches or uh, sites. So that's another thing you need to consider is this architecture gonna, con gonna support all of these use cases. And the last one is uh, remote users. Um, this last one is actually very important to startups because at get-go, they don't have any on-prem. Everything is in the cloud. How do you develop that? How do you access that? You cannot always do SSH into public IP or jump host into something that is just not a secure way to do, right? So remote access, SSL-based access, become very handy, uh, uh, important part of connecting. Even for enterprise, you have remote workers, road warriors, your contractors. So then when you build that kind of connectivity that allow them allow them to uh, allow people to connect to these to these different cloud directly when you do that what you need to consider is do i have dynamic enforcement to differentiate if this is a contractor this is a developer this is a devops do i have mfa do i have load balancer so that i can scale out do I have geo-based uh, VPN that, depending on where they come from, I will land them into the nearest, the shortest distance latency region? So these are the things you need to consider. So in summary, um, I think that is one picture. But in summary, now you can think about these are all types of connectivities. When you design your cloud network that you need to consider, that all our customers need uh, put, have that in mind and will consider, maybe I don't, in stage one, maybe I do transit, then I'll consider egress, I'll consider simultical. But these are the things, if you have that knowledge and understanding, appreciation ahead of time, it will help you a great deal. So that concludes my section. Quick question Wait. for the delegates. Mm -hmm. uh, if you've There's looked at architecting this uh, uh, a cloud, design. Have you seen it where it wasn't architected correctly? And then what was that like? Well, which component? Because there are like five of different things. use cases. So are you asking about any one of those components? Yeah, being it could be. Architected? Yeah. 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 Um, yeah I, so let's take the, the VPN case. Yeah. Right? Usually when it comes to VPNs, uh, it's difficult to know how to scale them, right? How many you need. Mm -hmm. uh, how to do that. So Which VPN, the user or the? A remote user. Yeah. Remote, remote user, user yes. VPN. Yeah. Uh, especially if uh, you're, you start small and you hit a rapid growth spurt. So I could see that being mismanaged. Yeah. Yes. Okay, great. So it's very important in the cloud. In, cloud is unique, right? On-prem, you can buy a 1RU. When you scale, you buy a 2RU until you buy a you know, 500K box, right? In the cloud, the largest instance is C5, and that can only support this much. So it's important to have the solution that can scale horizontally, that can stand behind the load balancer, right? The ELBs, the NLBs, that can, uh, like you said, when you go through the rapid growth of the system, uh, can still support you. And Another yeah, question. I yeah, I have a question um, related to use case one, to the transit network. Mm -hmm. Uh, we know that uh, it's extremely complicated to manage the appearing across VPCs, especially if you tend to to scale up the number, so you could end up with uh, with a mesh. Uh, so implementing the transit network uh, powered by Aviatrix, the, does it solve solve this out of the box, or is is it required to do additional configuration or additional you know architectural uh, design? Yeah, so this is one of the things we, um, it's one of the most popular use cases people buy, I mean, you uh, deploy Aviatrix is, um, I think in news demo, it will become very clear how you build the transit. Um, it is uh, very simple. And also we have a philosophy, you talk about build a mesh, right? Are you building a mesh by intent or you building mesh by accident? Well, normally if you don't uh, build um, your networking, considering the, the adoption of a transit network, you will end up building it by accident. 
Yes. So we have a lot of people, a lot of customers like that, because um, if you use the CSR based or anybody based, they build, they automatically form a full mesh. And what happened is um, these, a lot of these VPCs, remember you said one account, one VPC, right? They're different business units, they're different accounts. They're supposed to be segmented. The best practice is, you know, in on-prem we talk about um, um, what is it? Zero trust, isolation, because we are we we don't want a literal movement in the cloud. If you're not careful, you can easily build a full mesh network, and then you have to go implement policies everywhere to try mm -hmm. to shut down the uh, services. So it become extremely complex. Yes. Yeah, that's that's one of the things I was going to mention as well uh, as the discussion goes on. That for some organizations, actually, um, not having transitive booting is actually a security feature. Yes. So they actually prefer it. Uh, but going back to, you know, this um, traditional networking uh, or transit network. So in the days before when there wasn't any inter-region peering or direct connect gateways, this was obviously, I mean, still is, and for other reasons as well, uh, a unique um, product. But if we are purely talking about isolation and, you know, <laughs> routing between the different VPCs and the complexity of creating such environments, Automation obviously can resolve a lot of those problems. Now, we quite routinely see that AWS brings out a feature um, after third parties resolve that problem, and then they bring out another feature that sort of replicates the same thing. Now, currently, we have inter-region peering and direct gateway, and yes, with limitations. But going forward, if, for example, they come up with some same kind of ease of creation of these networks, and do you still think that your product will still stand up for other reasons as well? Yes. So, in fact, uh, the one of the, why people buy us, right? Buy us for simplicity, but a lot of it they buy us for visibility, monitoring. We have out of box integration with Splunk, Sumo Logic, Datadog, NetFlow, uh, Spam Ports, um, and people buy us for visibility. People buy us for troubleshooting and support and also buy us for security. Because we're not just single use case, we're doing egress, FQDM based firewall, we're doing user VPN, we're doing site to cloud. Network is always very complex. And we actually leverage AWS um, primitives, we call building blocks. In fact, in, we build into our product, for example, shared service, when you, when you create uh, connectivity to shared service, we can, you can use AWS peering. Now, AWS peering, also has limitations of 120. Yeah, with our controller we integrate in. There's 100 route limit, there's 100 uh, peering limit, right? So when you are at a scale of easily 200 spokes, 100 spoke, you run into that limitation. And Aviatrix product can, you know, right now we scale to up to 500 gig. We have actually that kind of deployment. So and yeah, just, does that answer your question? Yes, yes. And I'll add okay. that even if AWS has, say, a full mesh capability, that's where the security comes in because it's AVH's belief that it's not connectivity by default, it's connectivity by design. So all these, all your isolation remains while you have an easy-to-use transit solution. And that's something you'll see more. A uh, common issue that can happen with, with VPC sprawl is the duplication of uh, IP address spaces. Mm -hmm. So does your product help with this? Yes. So we have a tool called VPC Tracker because we've, I worked with the hundreds of cloud architects. Everybody has a spreadsheet. Everybody says this is this allocated. I don't know where is the other address space. So we have a VPC Tracker that will track all your cedar blocks so that when you, and it will check duplication. So hopefully that you can use this as a central place to manage uh, both your on-prem cedar blocks and your partner's cedar blocks and your cloud cedar blocks so that when you wanted to create a new one, you go through a check and you make sure that it, it does Yeah, but operate. sometimes you don't have control over yeah. that because so, your people deploy. Yes, yes. Can you mitigate? Yes. So we have, so this is very high level, right? In the product level, we have network mapping, as source net transiting, destination transiting, all kinds of completed connect, build connectivity between overlapping seeders, partial overlapping seeders, all of that. We have to have that kind of depth in the product in order to solve real world problems, yeah. 